Hi, I'm Jack Ravel, and this is Continuous Improvement T Television, CITV. Today, June 12, 1995, our special guest is Dr. George Box, talking to us about experimental design for quality improvement. Let me give you just a few of Dr. Dr. Box's extensive credentials. Dr. Box holds both a PhD and a Doctor of Science degree uh, from the University of London in mathematical statistics. He's known throughout the world as an outstanding lecturer, author, and industrial consultant. Dr. Box is currently a professor emeritus and director of research at the Center for Quality and Productivity Improvement at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He is especially well known for techniques he has developed such as response surface methodology, RSM, and evolutionary operation, or EVOP. He has published more than 150 papers and is the co-author of numerous books. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association of Science, the American Statistical Association, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and the American Society for Quality Control, of which he is both a Schuhart and Deming medalist. Dr. Box holds honorary degrees honorary doctorates from the University of Rochester, Carnegie Mellon University, and the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Box has agreed to participate in this uh, series of telecasts and talk to us about experimental design for quality improvement. It is my distinct honor, my privilege, to introduce to you for our two-hour presentation today, Dr. George Box. As a part of our telecast, we will have a 10-minute break, approximately halfway through the uh, telecast uh, starting at 20 after the hour and continuing till 30 minutes past the hour. We will also ask you to uh, call in your questions, uh, your concerns, your ideas uh, to Dr. Box and myself. Uh, during the telecast, you can see on the screen the numbers. Uh, the voice number is uh, area code 800-442-4613. And the fax number, if you choose not to be heard over the air, is 800 Seven six zero six zero six seven. 6067 uh, George has specifically asked that we reserve our questions until a, somewhere between 5 and 10 minutes after the hour so that he has an opportunity to begin the presentation and get well into it uh, before your initial questions. But he does, and I do, encourage uh, whatever questions you may have relative to the topic at hand today, experimental design for quality improvement. And now, let me introduce to you perhaps one of the best known statisticians in the United States, perhaps the entire world today, Dr. George Box. George, welcome to Continuous Improvement Television. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I wanted to talk today about uh, experimental design for quality improvement. And um, I think there's a danger when one talks about a particular thing that um, one will, so to speak, concentrate on that one issue and leave out the context in which that appears. Experimental design isn't the cure for everything, obviously. And so I'd like to say something, first of all, about the quality movement itself and where uh, statistical design really fits into that. And of course, uh, a, the, the, um, Quality movement is about the whole organization, from the president to the janitor, is part of a knowledge generating system. A, a company that can do that, uh, that can have in place such a continuously uh, improving uh, system, um, always in place, so to speak, can adapt itself to whatever the uh, situation may be, whether it's bad or good or whatever it may be, they can, uh, they're best able to do that because they're most able to learn. And um, I think if somebody asked me what quality is about, I would say it's about the democratization of scientific method for continuous quality improvement. That's what we're going to be talking about. And there are some words in there that need explanation. Uh, democratization, what do I mean by that? Scientific method, what do I mean by that? Continuous quality improvement and the word quality. 
Well, let me start by just saying something about quality. I think quality is a good word, but I think the quality movement is more than than that says. Um, it's it's really about the history of learning and of learning how to learn. Um, quality is about knowledge, and I think Dr. Deming made that point very strongly uh, uh, about about the importance of knowledge and knowledge generation. And so it's very pertinent to say, well, how did we learn? How are we, do we learn now? How will we learn in the future? And I think we can see, we can go back a little bit and, and, and learn something by just looking at how things used to be and how they developed. There was a, a pre-science phase, I'll call it, a science phase, and we're moving now into what I would call democratized science, which is the quality movement. And um, you can see that there was a period, I suppose it went up to probably about um, 1600 or so, um, when um, the scientific approach was less evident. And uh, coming up to, say, 50, 30 years ago, uh, science was regarded as something that a very special breed, breed of people did, scientists and so on. I think since Schuart in particular, and Deming and Duran, it's become clear that science can be simplified and can be used by everybody. And so that's what I mean by democratized science. And the result of that will be that the rate of change in our environment, which at the moment is very fast, will be even faster. And we have to be concerned about that. Let's look about uh, uh, at this pre-science phase. This is a page from the Cambridge University encyclopedia and you can see that that the uh, on the left at the top a you can see a an Egyptian ship which is 1300 uh, no it's actually 1500 BC and B on the top on the right is a Roman merchantman which is AD 200 uh, Viking longship AD 800 and a Portuguese carrack about 1500 AD so between A and D, the beginning and the end of that particular set of pictures, there's 3,000 years. And although it's true that, uh, that the, these uh, later ships were probably better designed than the, the Egyptian ship was, they're not all that much different. And then we look about the last 120 years or so, and we see the movement from E to, to H, and it's a tremendous change. And that's because of the application of scientific method to this question of transportation over the sea. In fact, you can see on this scale from, when you look at A, B, C, D, E, F, G, over on the, on the scale of, of um, the uh, time that F, H, uh, E and G are so close together, this lot here is so close together that they almost can't distinguish between them. So a, re a reasonable question is how did science catalyze learning? And I think you could answer that in a number of ways, but uh, three of the ways that you could, that are very important are the sharing of knowledge that you already have. And I'd quote as an example of that, I'd quote, cited an example of that, Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton developed the theory of gravitation, and really uh, he was putting together ideas from Galileo, uh, Copernicus, Kepler, 
and a lot of data from Tycho, a Danish astronomer, uh, uh, Kepler was German, Copernicus Polish and so on, so this was putting together a lot of things from a lot of different places and sharing that knowledge. And as I'll say in a moment, that same idea of sharing knowledge is very strong in the quality movement. Informed observation, um, well, Charles Darwin would be an example of that. He didn't actually do any experiments, Charles Darwin. Well, he may have done one or two, but most of what he did was um, look at what was there. Yogi Berra said, you can see a lot by just looking. And Darwin certainly saw a lot by just looking and came up with a theory of evolution. And uh, the third thing, the third method of science, you might say, is directed experimentation. Benjamin Franklin, uh, a man of many parts, uh, Benjamin Franklin, he, um, as you know, proposed that, uh, I say proposed because he didn't do it himself for good reason, uh, that somebody flew a kite in a thunderstorm and uh, that um, the idea was that to test the emanations that came down the string and to show that they were the same emanations that you could reproduce in the lab with a Wimsworth machine and that was static electricity so that thus proving that that a thunderstorm involves a electric it's an electric storm and um, so these are three types of understanding and increasing understanding, getting new knowledge, sharing knowledge already available to come up with something new, informed observation where you're not actually interfering with anything, you're just watching it, you're just looking at it. And, uh, and, the, um, and, the, um, and direct experimentation. And the, in the quality movement, you'll find all three of these democratized. Uh, now, shared knowledge, I mean, you should never despise the library. The library is a good place to get some shared knowledge from, to look in the journals, to, to look in the books and so on. Brainstorming is another example of shared knowledge. Teams are an example of shared knowledge. And the seven management tools, which, Jack, we, you've had people here discussing those, and um, QFD and so forth, they're all really ways of saying um, let's not do our separate things and so on let's let's pull out let's do it together let's do it together I mean there's the old story about the design people and the manufacturing people and the design people throwing it over the right. wall and never speaking to each other there are places today where that wall still exists really oh yes <laughs> I believe you in fact there was, this university, I'm sure we haven't got it all out yet, but there was a time when it took a week to get registered in this university. Mm. And that was because we had all these separate, there was one admissions and the, there was loans and so on, and they were all under separate. And the poor student had to fill up different forms whenever he went. It took him a week to do, to get registered, and now it's a matter of 20 minutes. And in some schools, you, you can actually register by telephone. You know, we do here, you know, yeah. touch telephone. So, uh, so that's uh, examples, really, of sharing knowledge. Informed observation, well, the seven quality tools, uh, for example, are examples of informed observation. And I often think about just defeating Murphy as, as, uh, as informed observation. A certain airline, I won't mention which, but it's gone out of business. I predicted 25 years ago that it would go out of business. And the reason I knew it would go out of business was I was sitting back there 25 years ago and, one, and, a, and a ventilator thing was dripping on my head. Well, it was water dripping on my head. And I, and I rang the, the thing, the calling the steward, and the steward came over and said yes. And I said, there's this um, ventilator dripping on my head. And he said, oh yeah, it always does that. I knew that airline was going to go into business because there was no feedback involved. Murphy had spoken, uh, but nobody heard him, and there was no system in, in place. And we all know these stories. And there was a wonderful story about that uh, during the Second World War. Jack Uden told me that the B-17s used to go and fly over Europe and uh, bomb Germany, and uh, some of them didn't come back. 
and they wanted to know if they had a little armor plate where they should put it. And uh, so what they did was, uh, every time a mission came in, they went over these planes very carefully, and there were a lot of planes that had holes in them. And they had a little model of a B-17, and they marked off on the model, on the wooden model, every time uh, where all these holes were. And when they'd run a few missions, they had hundreds of, in data from hundreds of planes, and there were some places where there weren't any marks. And those were the ones that hadn't come back, and uh, that's where they had to put the armor plate. So, I mean, just thinking about defeating Murphy, just thinking about ingenious ways of letting the process speak to you and persuading it to speak to you by not doing anything to it, but just watching it. Uh, but there are some problems that can't be solved that way, and those are the problems where we have to bring uh, directed experimentation, and uh, simpli as I would say, simplified experiment, uh, experimental design. Before I get on to that, I want to say something about another word that came into that beginning part. I talked about continuous quality improvement, and sometimes people say, you know, George or whoever is saying this, they say that you, you, you quality people talk about continuous improvement. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I got a Y, I've got an X, I got a graph of Y against X, and uh, I run some experiments along that graph and draw that graph, and it tells me that that's the, somewhere around there is the best place to, to get the maximum, and that's it. That's all the problem is. Well, what's the big deal? I mean, after that, you don't need to do anything. You're just wasting your time, aren't you? So this, this is all nonsense, this continuous problem. But of course, that's the way you might think about it if you're thinking about a, if you're thinking of a purely mathematical point of view, you might. But there are a number of assumptions being made there. You're assuming you know what X is, or not only, I mean, there wouldn't usually be one X, there'd be a lot of Xs and what they are, what the important variables are. You're assuming you know that already, and of course you don't. And you're assuming what Y is, in other words, what you should be measuring, and you very often don't know that either. And you're assuming you know what that, what that curve's like, you don't know that. So what you have to do is learn, and the learning process is something like this. You start off with some kind of idea, and sometimes that idea works out, and sometimes it it turns out that it's it's not quite the way you thought, and so you you um, you have to modify it, and you go to a different idea and so Mo on. Moving from A to B to you know, C. Moving from A to B to C. It's a learning process, and I think that this process of learning and understanding learning is what I would call an inductive deductive iteration. It gradually emerged over a long period of time. I. I thought at one time that uh, Francis Bacon was as far back as I could go with it, and then I found this guy, Gross Tester, Grosser Tester, who was Bishop of Lincoln, who was a wonderful person and uh, very interested in scientific methods, and, and really had this uh, iterative business, this inductive deductive iteration business worked out. But he claimed I read, I then read a translation of Gross Tester and. Um, and uh, he referred always to Aristotle, so I really don't know. The latest uh, version of it would be the Schuart Deming cycle, and um, I like to put it, I like to represent it in this way that we start off with some kind of theory, hypothesis, conjecture, idea, model. I, I, I regard these as essentially the same thing, and, um, and so we. Having got this idea, we expect the data or facts to be of a certain kind. And uh, maybe they are, which is all very nice. When we get some data or facts, it maybe works out the way we hoped. And maybe it doesn't. Hmm? You can change those. Yeah. Um, but uh, maybe it works out the way we want, maybe it doesn't. But uh, if it you can see that uh, we can, um, when it doesn't, we, so we're really putting together, let me just go back to this, we're really putting together um, 
we're really saying what we expect to see when we add the data so to speak to the to the to the idea and then this is saying but we don't actually quite see that we see something a bit different so then we have to change our mind and say what would produce that and uh, this is an inductive part this is deductive this is an inductive and and so that brings a somewhat different idea and when and any project goes going through any kind of uh, project uh, we're all detectives in this business and uh, design or, or development of a process or anything like that has to go through this kind of phase let's take a, a very um, everyday kind of situation to uh, illustrate what I mean by that I mean I I have a place where I keep my car and um, I might I uh, I don't actually have a place that's a private place to keep my car I have to put it where I can find a place but let's suppose I do okay <laughs> that makes my story easier uh, so I go to, to the car park after a day's work and I say today is like every day that's my model okay and the deduction is my car will be in the allotted parking place right but when I get there and look it isn't and I say ha ah, the, the induction is someone must have taken it so therefore I have to change my model now don't I and so my my model may be and people different people would can draw different conclusions but maybe I draw the conclusion my car had been stolen okay and my deduction from that was well one of my deductions will be the car won't be in the parking lot but no the data is no it's over there and so the induction is someone took it and brought it back and so my new model is a thief took it and brought it back and I thought well if a thief took it and brought it back my deduction will be a car's been broken into but no I go over and look at it it's unharmed and it's unlocked so someone who had a key took it and so then I say ah my wife my wife used my car deduction she's probably left me a note I look for it and the answer is yes here it is you, you certainly have an interesting life <laughs> <laughs> well that wasn't the most interesting thing that ever happened to me <laughs> well the um, recent discoveries have confirmed what some people had long suspected I mean I, me I mentioned among these some people Henry Poincaré who was a famous mathematician uh, about the turn of the century he was saying essentially that he's sure that the brain consisted of two parts because of the uh, the way in which he would sleep on something and then come up with the answer and so forth and, and he would he, he, he indicated that and William James is Henry James's brother famous psychiatrist about the same time was also talking in those kinds of terms and um, but recent discoveries have shown that the brain does in fact consist of two parts and there's as we know now for most people there's a left brain and a right brain with the left brain mostly concerned with analysis and deduction and the right brain with creativity and induction and these are continually talking to each other uh, uh, by means of the corpus callosum which is a series of connections between these these two parts now um, so there's this sort of conversation going on all the time in our heads we don't actually hear it but it's going on there in which the right brain and left brain are interrogating each other and saying could it be due to this and so maybe that and so on and um, now this process of uh, the, I just said data before data and facts now when, when you say data uh, people are liable to jump to conclusions this process I'm talking about here is really very a very general process it wouldn't matter whether you're doing uh, whether you were researching history or whether you were researching uh, atomic uh, um, uh, chemistry uh, it'd be the same kind of thing and and it, one thing that uh, I don't think we should ignore is that the data getting could be just going to the library and I sometimes say to people when they want to run an experiment or something are you, have you, are you sure you've checked out all the, th the stuff that's, that's there already so go to the library another source of data is look at the process 
whatever it is. Might be the process of admission to a hospital for that matter, or anything. No, you, you make, a, I think, a very important point here, and that is a lot of people, when they think of data, yeah. it is strictly quantitative data, yeah. when in fact qualitative data can sometimes be very valuable. Absolutely, yes, that's very true. Um, and sometimes uh, qualitative data, uh, as you say, isn't really thought of as being data at all, but it is. And then, of course, if you can't get information by those means, then you might run an experiment. And this iteration we see here is, of course, what's meant by the Schuart deming cycle. Um, plan, do, check, act. And this is, a, as, as it is here, a continuous, as it is here, I'm sorry, I'm pointing the wrong thing, as it is here, it's a continuous thing. Um, so, now, so let me talk now about some about the design of experiments. Um, and design of experiments was invented by a guy called Ari Fisher in the 1920s. A lot of people don't know that you knew him personally. Yeah, I did, and a fascinating man. I met, I've only met, I think, one person that I would really call a genius in my life, and um, that was Fisher. And he, I mean, you just knew when you... He had brilliant met, insights, no yeah, question about it. Yeah, but you knew when you talked to him, you know, this guy's just not... He knew all kinds of things about all kinds of things. <laughs> you go for a walk with him, and he'd he'd uh, just tell you, all, you know. And he told me a lot about when he first came to Wisconsin. He told me all about the geology. It must have been this way, George, don't you think? And, and uh, he he told me things, and I'd never really seen those things. So when when we looked at the lakes and things like that, and uh, he would pick up a flower and see all sorts of things in it that that you would. So anyway, he was a, quite a guy. But one of the things uh, he was concerned about was how do you run an experiment so you end up with a conclusion and not an argument? And I want to, this is a very important point, and um, I want to say something about it. And um, the, uh, what we usually do when we, when, we, um, when we teach this to our engineers is we, we use a, a paper helicopter, and I'm going to say more about this paper helicopter in a bit. But just to, just to illustrate a very simple kind of experiment, and the fact that you can get into trouble with a very simple kind of experiment, let me imagine the following scenario, okay? And we do this with our, with our students. We say that uh, Tom comes up with a helicopter design, a paper helicopter you can make, as you've seen in that last slide. And Kip Rogers, actually, was the guy who introduced me to this idea. Um, you can come up with a paper helicopter like this. And you, um, let's suppose Tom drops it four times. And he, uh, purposely. Purposely, yes. He drops it from the same height four times. And what he's interested in was seeing if he could design a helicopter which stays in the air a long time. Now, the flight times in tenths of a second are, are 31, 25, 29, and 31. That's 3.1, 2.5, and so on, with an average there, an average you can see there, of, um, whoops, um, let's, can we go back one? Let's try going back one. I, I'd like to go back one if I could. We're trying to go back one slide here. Can we go back one? Okay, you need to take your hand off, she said. Okay. There we go. Right. Um, what I um, wanted to... Mm. Do, it, do it again, please. Just yeah, release it. No, we're going back the wrong... We're going the wrong way. Can we, can we go back again, please? You, you have to take your hand off the whole thing. Now. Okay. Okay, they're going to bring it back for you. Well, thank you. Um, what I'll, can we go back three slides now, please? That's it. Okay, there we are. I better not touch it. Either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, uh, so Tom's dropped his helicopter four times and he's, and he's got an average of 29. And he's plotted his data there on the left, you can see, for the blue helicopter. And uh, Dick comes along and says, I don't think much of that helicopter. 
I made a different design. I made a different design for a helicopter like this. And you can see he's bent over the wings and he's got a shorter body here. And I dropped that helicopter four times yesterday when after I designed it in the conference room. And I got a lot better results than you did. In fact, every one of my points is higher than yours and uh, gives a longer flight time. And that's statistically significant. Whatever that means. Whatever that means. So, <laughs> so, so Mary, it was uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry, but my wife insisted that it should be Mary because she's got the best lines. Okay, and fair Ma enough. So Mary says, well, that doesn't prove a darn thing. She says, you say you dropped in the conference room yesterday, okay? Yesterday it was wet and cold. Today is dry and fine. You dropped it in the conference room, okay? Now, when you drop in the uh, when you drop anything in that conference room, there's a there's a draft in there from that window, and the the helicopter kind of drops slightly at an angle, and that gives a longer flight time. And you dropped it. Well, the, you, where did you drop it from? You stand on the on the conference table and stand dropped put it on the ceiling because the ceiling's at a different height there than it is here. And uh, any case. Uh, Dick dropped that one and Tom dropped the other. Did they drop it the same way? Did they hold it the same way when they dropped it and so on? Now, I don't know if about you, but I've been in a situation in industry exactly like that, where somebody's run an experiment. It may be a simple experiment where you're just comparing this method with this method. And all you get is a big argument. You sit around the table. There's Joe Blow over there. He doesn't want this to be true, because if it is, it's going to cause him a lot of grief. And somebody else over there who would like it to be true. And somebody else has got some other uh, agenda and so forth, and you just get a big argument. What Fisher said you could do is you can run an experiment like that, so all of those questions would be eliminated. And he does that by introducing what's called randomization and blocking. Now, in this particular experiment, all it amounts to is saying what you do is you've got your two helicopters, and you compare them and Dick drops them at the same time, or one immediately after the other in random order. And you take the difference in flight times. And then if you like, Tom drops them. And uh, maybe Mary drops them. And they maybe drop them in different places. But the point is that for each pair, the conditions are, are the same. And uh, that's called a paired, uh, a paired comparison test. And that, if you, if you do that, you randomize that, you have a, a valid comparison, and Fisher developed those ideas. Now, the other thing, another very important idea that Fisher introduced was factorial experimentation. And um, I want to illustrate that. Now we're getting to, to some interesting things. I, I, but I'm not going to use complicated designs or anything. I'm just going to use very simple ones. We had a student at, here in Madison called Krista Hellstrand. And uh, he um, was here, I guess, in the late 1980s. And he went to um, uh, SKF. SKF is the largest manufacturer of ball bearings in the world. They have manufacturing plants in 14 countries. And they do extremely well and uh, are extremely competitive in their manufacturers. Well. They, at that time, were interested in running an experiment. And um, the experiment they wanted to run concerned the cage uh, in which these balls are. And the cage uh, is the outer casing. And the idea was that they could make this cage of a, another material, which is actually cheaper, and should have been actually better, because these new materials are coming in all the time. And so what they planned to do was to manufacture, um, to actually use the plant to produce eight runs. And they're going to manufacture the balls in eight periods of time uh, on the plant. And so he had these eight runs available. Uh, and they told him and uh, asked for any advice he might give them. And he said, well, you're going to use these eight runs just to test one factor. And they said, well, we think we'll have to repeat it over to make sure that we've got what we think. He said, well, wouldn't you like to try something else? And they said, well, we, we would, but we don't want to get involved in more than eight runs. We've set aside one of our lines to do this. That's a big investment. He said, well, can you tell me in a couple of factors, other factors you'd like to look at? And they said, well, 
we've got some people here who've got some strange ideas and we've been making bearings a long time but they want to they've got this heat treatment for the balls that they want to try and they've got a way of changing the osculation which is the amount of touching that the balls have on the, on the, on the, the uh, casing and um, he said well let's put those in and they said oh you mean run a one factor of time experiment like this uh, where you'd you'd have uh, on this you'd have um, you'd have the the uh, standard uh, perhaps we could move on to the next slide um, yeah, you'd have the the standard um, the, the standard runs here and then you'd modify the osculation keeping everything else constant you'd modify the type of heat treatment and you modify the cage keeping everything constant each time that's a one factor of time experiment and um, he said no no I don't want you to do that uh, I I would like you to run a factorial experiment in which you run all the combinations um, in this way and that's let, let me ask you a question I, yeah. some of our, our viewers who may be new to the topic of yeah. uh, designed experiments may wonder where the name factorial came from it came simply from the fact that it contains a number of factors Yates uh, was uh, Fisher's first uh, uh, deputy assistant, so to speak, and um, and he called them factorial experiments because there were a number of factors involved. Okay, I thought that perhaps there was something no. deeper to it. No, and you can see that they they got a remarkable result. The kind of numbers they were expecting on this um, this is an accelerated test they do, and uh, these actually represent thousands and thousands of hours of wear that you're seeing here the time to, uh, to time for the bearings to wear out and you can see that um, the standard conditions which are the the ones here uh, you get here and here you well your standard conditions here are, are given about 17 20 that sort of thing there's a variation in the these numbers uh, but you are not getting much different if you just change osculation you're not getting much different if you just change the cage and you're not getting just very much difference if you just change the, the heat. And but those, when, those when represent the, the me measurements, the performance? Yeah, that's right. The number of hours of, of uh, before. Well, it's really representing uh, the, it's a proportion of the number of thousands of hours mm -hmm. that you'd go before the bearing failed. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And you can see that up here they're getting, when they change both osculation and heat together, they're getting numbers that are five times as big. A very dramatic change. And uh, that saved uh, many, many millions. It was actually done in England, many, many millions of pounds, I'll say, because it was pounds in the very first year. And um, it's a very simple experiment, but notice that unfortunately it's true that most people still run one factor of time experiments. And um, with one factor of time experiments, the assumption is made that the effective factors will be additive. Mm -hmm. But, of course, a lot of things aren't additive. Some, some things that depend on interaction, for example, is sexual reproduction, a number of important things. I've always considered it that. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And um, so, as a lot of these, one of the things this teaches us is it's tremendous, probably a tremendous number. Since people have always done one factor of time experiments, there's a tremendous number of things that depend on interaction like this waiting to be discovered and uh, you know that that's a thing that you you've got to think about let, let me remind our audience as we uh, come uh, within now 15 minutes of uh, our break that we uh, we have a, both a phone number and a fax number uh, that we would encourage you to call and uh, I think we've gotten to a point in our in our telecast now where George uh, I think it would be appropriate if somebody wanted to call in that they could. Yeah. Uh, both are 800 numbers. Uh, the uh, number for uh, calling in directly by voice is 800-442-4613. That, that's on your screen. And if you choose to fax in, it's 800-760-6067. I would really encourage you to call in and see uh, what uh, George has to say on a particular topic relative to uh, your concern. And with that, back to George. Yes. Well, I wanted to say about these uh, designs that 
the particular design I'm showing you is, of course, a very simple one, uh, but a lot can be done with very simple designs. I, uh, a man I greatly revered was uh, L.H.C. Tippett. He was a, um, originally a statistician with the Cotton Research Institute in England and, and uh, later the Textile Institute, and, and he eventually became a director of that. And very early on, in the 1930s, he was running uh, uh, designs. Then he, when I went to, uh, I was in industry for 10 years in ICI, up in, near there in Manchester. And uh, we used to, I used to meet him and he was like a father to me, he was very nice to me, he was a young chap, just starting out. He used to say, George, always remember, keep it simple, keep it simple. Because um, complicated designs have their place, uh, but there are some things where, you know, if you can vary one or two or three things, you're doing pretty well, and especially when you're varying things on, on the full scale. Hey, you mentioned that Tippett was doing experiments in the 30s. Yeah. Was he doing them uh, with an awareness of what uh, oh. R.A. Fisher was doing? Oh, yes. He, would, he studied with Fisher and with Pearson. Ah, good. And, okay. uh, and, uh, was, and did, did some very interesting work. And, and in fact, uh, Tippett is the very earliest applications of orthogonal rays. He didn't call them that, and, but it was, was to a spinning machine where he was trying to find out what part of the spinning machine was causing problems. Um, now, these designs can be used uh, not only for, um, not only for um, looking at changes in the mean, which is what we showed in the last slide, but also uh, for looking for changes in variation. And I've, I've shown, instead of just giving numbers, I've shown a set of, as they might be, quality control charts uh, at, at different conditions of the machine, uh, different combinations of three factors A, B, and C. And you can see that when you increase, when you increase uh, B, that's to say this factor here, you go from here to here, across this way, that you, you increase the mean. You can see there to there, you get an increase in mean. There to there, you get an increase in mean. There to there, you get an increase in mean. And there to there, you get an increase in mean. However, if you change factor C, you can see you get a decrease in variation as you go this way. And so these things can not only be used to study what happens to the level of the process, and you may want to adjust the level, but also uh, to tell you something about uh, what things are causing and producing a lot of variation. I think I happen to think that's one of the most insightful graphics that you have in this collection. Thank you. I might say, actually, that it doesn't end there, because we have had examples. In fact, my friend Simon Bisgard um, has a very nice example where the problem actually was that there was a cycle. There was a, actually a, a cycle in, in the process. And so what you were trying to do was to get rid of that cycle, mm -hmm. that cycling. And uh, so you could run a factorial and ask the question, uh, which way do we have to go in order to reduce that cycle to more? And uh, actually, they, it was very interesting because they ended up saying, well, what is the period of that cycle? Right. And then they found out that what it was associated with was a number of, um, well, there's a belt. And the number of, of pieces on that belt corresponded to the, to the period. And uh, they found out what, what it was. What, it's very nice when you could do that. Yes. Yeah. But first of all, they had, <laughs> had to find it. And of course, it was originally buried in a lot of noise. Um, About five minutes. Yeah. Well, one of the, um, taking this a little bit further, um, one of the uh, techniques that I found was very valuable and, and that when I went, first went to ICI, uh, Imperial Chemical Industries in England was where I went to work when I, after I came out of the army in uh, 1945, 46. Gee, that was a long time ago, George. Uh, no, yeah, wait a minute. No, I went, first of all, I went to university college, but after I came out of university college, the first job I was at was, was uh, ICI. And I was, I think I was there for nine, I was there nine years, I told you eight. But anyway, um, they said to me that they wanted to improve their, their yields. And um, I developed response surface methods, which uh, appeared in a paper in 1951 um, 
Bond, myself, and, and a chemist called Wilson. And really, the idea of this is really very simple. I mean, we know we all draw graphs like this one in one dimension. And uh, what it really is is a way of looking at things graphically in more than one dimension. So, for example, if you think of that graph that I drew there where I'm plotting uh, yield against temperature, you imagine I put a series of those those lines back to back at, at different levels of the, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, in the next slide you'll see, uh, well I guess we're not going to get the next no, slide. Push it. Push it? Not it. Oh you. yeah, yeah, in that you can see, oops, one back, one back please. Back please. Back please, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's me. You have to take your hand off, he said. Yeah, it's me. I'm sorry. Would you go back a couple, please? Yeah. Okay. When you go back to this one, you can see that um, as you change the concentration, you can imagine that the temperature yield graph will change. And you join all those graphs together, you'll get a surface like that. Now, that's a cumbersome thing. I mean, it, what it's saying is that you can, you can measure, um, you can measure the, uh, the, at any particular level of temperature and concentration, you'll get a certain yield. That's the height of that surface there. And that's nice, but it's cumbersome to have to carry a thing like that around in your head or in, on a, whatever you do, a model. You can imagine that what would happen if you put that in a bathtub of water, that model, and uh, as you change the water level, so you get a series of contours. And so you can represent the same thing by means of a contour graph. And uh, you can see in the next slide that um, those contours. And that represents the same thing as we saw before. And, uh, and furthermore, if you uh, want to take that one step further and you say, but I got another variable, I got pressure. Well, you can imagine these uh, contour graphs built one on top of the other and joined together to make this kind of diagram like that. And what design of experiments is about, really, is where do I put, where do I put my points in this space? Where do I put them? You know, I had them on a cube before. Maybe I shouldn't always have a cube. Maybe I should have some other shape. To explore that area there and find out where those contours are and find out where they're going. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for for responses. In order to do this, though, you're, you're forced into using uh, three factors. Three levels. Three, fa three factors like concentration, temperature, and. Uh, oh, you can do it for one, pressure. two factors. But then you only have the uh, two dimensional graphic. Well, that's right. You have a two dimensional graphic, but then you have a little square of points, which okay. is your design. And um, you don't necessarily get involved in three levels either because there, there are these special response service designs which, uh, well, not. I mean, you, you might think you get involved in a tremendous number of experiments, but you don't, because there are special response service designs, which you can take, take a cube and then you can put some points around it like that without running everything at three levels when to, to get those curved surfaces. And so um, we found that was very valuable and applied that to a lot of things, and it's been applied to many more things since. Uh, at this point, uh, we're just about ready to take our... Uh our middle break. Uh, it's approximately 20 minutes after the hour. Uh, we still don't have any calls or questions. I would encourage you during the 10-minute uh, the break that we have here from now till 30 minutes after the hour uh, that you formulate your ideas, your questions, and either call them into us uh, during the break or, or fax them in uh, or uh, during the second half of our telecast today. Uh, at this point, uh, you've got about 10 minutes to do what needs to be done, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you uh, after the break. Uh, remember, uh, George will be back after the break and uh, here to continue his presentation as well as to answer your questions. See you then.
Hi, we're back. This is Continuous Improvement Television, CITV, June 12, 1995. I'm Jack Revell, and today my guest is Dr. George Box of the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, Dr. Box is talking to us today about experimental design and for, for continuous improvement, and right in the middle of a discussion now of uh, a factorial design. We'll come back to George in just a second, but let me remind you uh, that we've got two phone numbers for you to use to call in and fax in your questions. Your voice number is 800-442-4613. Your fax number is 800-760-6067. And with that, I return you to your uh, speaker today, Dr. George Box. Thank you. Well, before I was talking about response surfaces, and uh, some people think this is something rather complicated. It doesn't have to be. And um, I think these ideas are very important. Perhaps their ideas are more important than the, the details. Um, so I'm going to illustrate some ideas, particularly about the fact that very often when we deal with these kinds of things, we're looking at several different uh, measurements, the different responses. And so I'm going to take a uh, experiment that was done a few years ago uh, by um, Albert Pratt and uh, Xavier Tort, the two gentlemen who have had a lot to do with the center here and uh, from Spain. And this is a, an experiment on, on dog food. Now, the people are making and manufacturing this dog food were getting too much powder in the product, and their customer was uh, unhappy about this. And so they decided that, that uh, they would run an experiment to see whether they could find uh, conditions which of uh, manufacture which would reduce the amount of powder in the product. And uh, so you can see the experimental conditions there. Uh, the, what they decided to change was, uh, was a measure of temperature, of uh, flow, and something called a compression zone. And um, they changed those uh, again in a, a two, two cube factorial like the one I showed you before. Um, the standard conditions were the, the conditions you see on the left there, mark minus, 80% uh, of max, 80% of max, and two inches for the compression zone. And the alternative set of conditions were max, max, and 2.5 inches. And so they ran um, those, uh, those various conditions, and for the powder in the product anyway, that's, those are the results they got. This is a measure of how much powder there was in the cans of dog food that were going out to the customers. They actually, the way they actually did that was to uh, send out dog food and send it through all the the uh, vic vicissitudes that it normally has to go through in a truck and so forth, and mm -hmm. up and down. The various time. venues. The various vendors, and, and took a number of samples and, and found out uh, how much actually got there in the, in the product. And you can see that um, if you look, you can see that down here you're getting a much less. I mean, these are the standard. This is the standard manufacturing conditions, and you can see over here that uh, you're getting much less. So you might think, well, that's a good place to quit. You're you're um, you're getting a lot less uh, power in the product over there. But uh, well, a number of things you might say about that. First of all, you're not really just looking uh, just to find the the best fix. I mean, you're also looking. Um, and this is perhaps, uh, I mean, if it's, it's a very worthwhile improvement from uh, 132 to 92. About a one-third decrease. A one-third decrease, but maybe we can do a lot better. I mean, 92 may still be not all you'd want. Um, I suppose uh, you'd like no powder in the product if you get it. So another question will be, uh, well, we're doing great, but uh, how can, what, where should we go next and things like that. But in order to consider that, you really have to take into account sort of directions, which way things are heading, so to speak. And you can roughly see that. A rather better way to see which way things are heading is to think in terms of those contours that I told you about before. And you can see, uh, if you wanted to sketch in the contours out there, there's, there's a sort of an official way to do this. There's an official way to do this, but uh, with a calculation, but and the computer will do it for you. But you can see the idea. I mean, there's a 132 there, there's a 104 there. So if you were said, you're interested to say, well, is there a sort of plane on which we're getting about 120, 
you can see that plane would have to go through about there because there's 132 there, 104 there. Interpolating there roughly gives you about 120 there. There's a 132 there and there's a 117 there, so the plane will go through at about that point. There's a 117 and 132 down there, and uh, there's uh, down at the bottom. And so um, the plane will go uh, through about there and so on. So you join those points together and you get a, a, a plane. And uh, if you uh, you can do that for 120, you can do it, put in a, a, we call it a contour plane, you can do that for, get a 120 contour plane. This is like with the weather map, the isothermal lines. That's right, you know, exactly, that's exactly right. And, uh, but you can also do it to get a, one, a 110, and a, you can see here there's a, there's a 110 uh, plane here, and there's a, uh, well, maybe like over here some places is, is 100, and so on. And you can see the general direction through those planes is down to that corner, which you might expect. But uh, I haven't told you the whole story yet, because there's also a question uh, of economics, as always. And uh, one of the economics is that another thing they were measuring was the yield. And it didn't cost them anything more to do this. I mean, they, they're, uh, they're running these experiments. They might as well do as many measurements as they can Absolutely. on each run. So one of the things they were measuring was how much yield are we getting uh, in each of these runs. And you can see, unfortunately, that the, you know, I won't bother you with the details, but when you sketched in the contours for yield, you found that was going in the opposite direction. So you wanted a high yield, you weren't going to also be able to get this low, um, cons uh, low uh, level of the, the powder. Another consideration was the, was the um, the amount of electricity that was being used, the energy use, and uh, the, the, so and that, they measured that's going off in another direction. That's going off in another direction. So, you know, you're left with this thing about well, what can we do about this? We got we got uh, pushed in every direction, and very often that's the case. Um, now, the other thing about it is that one of those things, of course, is the amount of powder in the product, and that's an imponderable. I mean. How much do you turn off a customer by having too much power in the product? It depends on your competition, depends on a whole lot of things. Uh, however, the yield is something you can cost. You can say, well, each 1% uh, of yield is worth this much to us, and you can say this much per pound of product. And you can also say uh, how much is uh, using more energy or less energy worth to us and this much uh, less energy is worth this much. And so what you can do is to cost each one of these points in terms of yield and energy, and then draw another set of contours. And uh, I've done that um, in this next slide. And you can see uh, that I marked a break-even point. That means that on that line, which is, as you notice, goes through, uh, goes through the point here because that's where we're normally manufacturing. So all of these things cost about the same. You can see by being over here, you're going to have a lot less if you think where those contours were for the, for the, um, for the powder in the product. You're going to have a lot less powder over here, and it's not going to cost you any more. So that's good news. It, it also will give you an idea of how much it would cost you if you wanted to do a little better, for example. It also gives you an idea about where you might run further experiments, because you are up against this barrier. I mean, this is the maximum temperature you can run at. And so assuming that really is a maximum, then uh, the next thing you do, uh, as you see in the next slide, is you start to say, well, where shall we put our next set of experiments? And you can see that down here would be a good place to explore next. Now, I always wonder about when people say that's the maximum temperature. Sometimes you say, well, really? I mean, I suppose you really think you could get a much better product if you could move that. Well, they may say, well, it's, much better, it's the highest temperature we, we can use if we're going to use this equipment. If we modify the equipment slightly, we could use a lot higher temperature. So sometimes those barriers are not as concrete as they first of all look. And so you should make inquiries about those things. The same thing goes for specifications. Sometimes specifications are uh, <laughs> very little basis for, for that specification. 
it somebody decided on it at some point and uh, sometimes uh, moving a little bit one way or the other uh, can, can can be allowed and you know, George if I may yeah uh, you made a, a point here on this particular slide that uh, uh, slide number 44 for the for our viewers yeah that was amplified considerably in the box hunter and hunter book yeah uh, statistics for experimenters yeah I, I do not recall the exact page. It was either page 320 or 302, something like that. Mm. But it's called the 25% rule. Yeah. And this 25% rule uh, addresses the the subject of making sure that the the budget that is provided for your uh, experimentation should be limited in round numbers to about 25% of the uh, of that the budget for the first experiment, because there will be mm. further experiments. A lot of people I've discovered. Mm. Uh, both in industry and in academe, uh, seem to think that one experiment will take care of the whole thing if, yeah. if they run one very sophisticated uh, and highly complex, when in actual fact, yeah. that is simply the jumping off point, the beginning yeah. of a whole series of experiments. That's, that's very true. You know, Fisher said, uh, he said a number of things, but one of the things he said is rather clever, I think he said, um, the best time to plan an experiment is after you've done it. <laughs> and man had a and sense of humor. He, he certainly did. And and what he means by that is that we've all experienced this. That you you if you're going to use up your whole budget with the first experiment, I mean, remember when you're planning an experiment, when you know least, you know least about what's going to happen. And what you'd much better do is to use some of your budget, perhaps 25 percent, to do some uh, do a small fractional design or some kind of small design, uh, which doesn't use too many experiments. You just see which end is up and get things uh, straightened out. I want to talk about um, some other, another type of design, which is a, a somewhat more complex, but is also important. And these are screening designs. Now, these screening designs are fractional designs and uh, other orthogonal arrays. The, um, they were developed, actually, uh, in England during the war um, and uh, written about uh, well, Finney, uh, D.J. Finney, who was a student of Fisher's, had the uh, has a complete theory of these in, in his paper. And Plackett and Berman were two interesting guys. They worked for the Ministry of Supply, which was in a group called SR-17, which reported directly to Churchill. And uh, they had this problem of um, designing a proximity fuse, which was a fuse which would ex which would have a shell which would explode when it was near an airplane, didn't have to actually hit the airplane. And um, they... Uh, it was a little mini radar. Yeah. But there were a lot of factors in that. And uh, so they devised these orthogonal arrays. And uh, first, uh, that actually and it was a 12-run orthogonal array with 11 factors in it that they, they used uh, to, to determine which were the important factors. So these, when I say screening designs, what you're really... With these designs, you're really saying, uh, we... We're in an early stage in the investigation. We don't really, we got a whole lot of factors. We don't really believe all these are important. We don't know which ones are, and we would like to find out. And so these designs are extremely valuable for that purpose. And uh, there's a, an experiment here, which I'm going to show you, which is an extrusion process experiment. Now, you may not be able to see this very well, but you can probably see it in the, your handout. It's on page uh, 46. It's on page 46, as you say, and there's, there's actually eight factors that are being looked at here, and are being screened, if you like. And uh, it's an uh, extrusion process. There's the mold temperature, there's the moisture content, there's the holding pressure, there's the uh, cavity thickness, booster pressure, cycle time, gate size, and screw speed. And George, forgive me for interrupting, yeah. but some of our, our viewers uh, may not be as familiar with the concepts of design of experiments as others. Yeah. Could you take just a moment and differentiate for us the difference between a, a factorial design, a fractional factorial design, and an orthogonal array? Yeah. Well, a factorial design is a complete factorial, and you can see that the problem with that is, I mean, if you have just three factors, then two to the power of three is eight, and so that's not a terrible large number. It's eight experimental eight, runs. Eight experimental runs, but but with four factors, it would be 16. With five factors, it would be 32. With six factors, it would be 64, and so on. And so these people, Finney and uh, so so forth, were concerned with saying, can we have uh, fractional factorials? In other words, 
experiments in which you don't run all those combinations. You run a very specially selected group of those. Now, the theory behind these, this is, is really quite interesting, and uh, mathematically, but you don't really need to know the theory. You, you just have a, a set of, uh, a, a, just a, what, what our engineers do is they just have a table of designs. Uh, one such table is um, uh, devised by my colleague, Bisgard. He has a little red book that you can get from, from I guess, from the center. And, uh, and all these designs are sort of listed, so mm -hmm. you, can, you can just run them out. You don't, you just, uh, and there are computer programs, so many of them around. You just ask, you know, how many factors you've got, how many runs are you prepared to make, and so on, and it'll figure out for you uh, what's available. So um, that's a fractional design, and I thought it's a particular case an orthogonal array because in the the columns in this thing, uh, you can see these columns of signs. They have a very interesting property. There's four lower levels and four higher levels in each column, and they're matched. If you if you uh, they're completely balanced, if you if you take the say the the four the eight minuses, I should say eight. I was just going to say for. For, meant, an eight, for an eight run, it would yeah, be four and four. Yeah, but for 16, it's eight. So there's, there's eight minuses here. And if you look at those eight minuses and you go across this way, you'll find that they're opposite four pluses and four. Each set, of those eight minuses are opposite four pluses and four minuses in every other column. And the four pluses, similarly, are opposite uh, four minuses and four pluses in every other column. So this thing is totally balanced. It applies to every column. And this is called orthogonality. And um, it means that you can, uh, these, these things don't become correlated unnecessarily. And, you know, in ordinary data, regression data, data that just happens very often, you don't know whether it's this or that because when this goes up, that goes up. Mm -hmm. this, this is a way of separating that. And um, anyway, you can see that what they're going to do in this first run, they're going to run the low mole temperature, the low moisture content, the low holding pressure, uh, the high um, cavity thickness, the high booster pressure, and so on. And for that run, they found they got a shrinkage of 140. They're trying to get the smallest possible shrinkage. Now, so, so that's essentially what they're doing. And um, what you see that that's only eight, 16 runs, and now there are eight factors there, so that uh, 2 to the 8th is 256. So that's a 1 16th fraction of the full you could also say it's an orthogonal array. It's called an L16 orthogonal array. It's the Be same. It's the same thing. Because it's an orthogonal array because of the balance features. The balance. Features. If the balance did not exist, it then it would be strictly a fractional factorial. No, and the fractional factorial is a particular case of orthogonal arrays. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, in Plack and Berman's uh, work, they they have all the orthogonal arrays, uh, two-level orthogonal arrays, and a lot of three-level orthogonal arrays. From um, from four up to uh, I think it's 96, which is about as big as you'd ever want to get. More than more than yeah. enough. Yeah, and uh, when it corresponds to say a power like eight or 16 or so on, it usually is the standard uh, factorial, yeah, fractional factorial. But then then you see you've got designs for 12 and 20 and 24 and numbers like that. So um, these um, so that's what they did. Now, what you can do is you can work out the effect of these factors. And essentially what you do is you say, well, I got eight runs in which the, um, the mold temperature, for example, is at a low level. I got eight runs with a high level. And I can take the average shrinkage in those eight runs and, uh, in which it was a low level and compare it with the average shrinkage in which it was a high level. So and, I, would, uh, that, I, would, I would then take the results of, for example, experimental runs, uh, one, three, Five, seven, etc. Wherever there was a minus sign, yeah, and sum all those results up the the y the y value the shrinkage, yeah, and that would then be my uh, av average and, performance. And divide, divide by eight because to get an right. average, and and that would then give me the figure that, for the low level, yeah, of, give, of the uh, mole yeah. temperature. Yeah, and you do the same for the pluses. Okay, and that would say how much on the average uh, does shrinkage change as we change mole temperature. Gotcha, and and those. Now, you can analyze uh, experiments like this. You can get all involved in complicated analyses and so on. But um, the, there are perfectly good ways to do this, which have a lot to be said for them. Um, 
and not only from simplicity but for other reasons and uh, uh, there was an American statistician called Cuthbert Daniel. There is an American statistician called Cuthbert Daniel. He'll, he'll be relieved to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's 84 years old, I think now, 85. But uh, Cuthbert's still going strong, as I know. As I know. And uh, he was responsible for this uh, normal plot, which I'll show you here, which is of great value to engineers. Um, and uh, you can see that in the next slide. Now, you can see that on that normal plot, there are there are three points. The, each of these points corresponds to uh, one of these effects. And you can see that, um, I, I guess I'm not getting down to that bottom one, but that, that uh, you can see there's one at the bottom there, opposite the number one, and there's two at the top, which really aren't, that middle lot is probably just noise, this lot here. And uh, because uh, those are more or less on a straight line. But these one over here are way off that line, and so is the one which is down the bottom there. How, how did you make the jump from the previous view graph, the previous slide? Well, we to this? we we calculated the effects for all of the we calculated the all the effects, all the, the, the all the changes. The differences between the highs and the lows. Yeah, we calculated the differences in highs and lows, and then we um, we simply collect those together, and we say, well, the lot smallest one is this one, and this is a scale is just like plotting on normal you know you plot on log paper mm -hmm. with this you plot on normal probability paper and on that paper a um, if the data are just noise they'll plot as a straight line and so when you've got some uh, in this case you've probably got three really facts um, and uh, those are coming out as uh, those effects there I'm in trouble with this thing um, down to the bottom here. That arrow doesn't want to work, does it? No. But anyway, down at the bottom, you can see there's another one that's off the line. And those three correspond to the, um, these, these three factors here. Uh, as you can see in the next, uh, in the on next on slide. slide 48. On slide 48. And you can see that those actually, well, you can't see it, but they do actually correspond to holding pressure. Um, uh, booster pressure and screw speed so that what this is saying is that the those are the three important factors the others are just in there for the ride and the interesting thing about that is that when you if you say well if that's true then when I look at all those pluses and minuses I, I'm and then just concentrate on those columns there those those three columns that are, that are causing all the all the, apparently causing all the stuff which is not noise well, you find that you've got a complete factorial in those. You've got a complete set of minuses and pluses for those three variables to make up a cube. And so here's your, here's your um, complete uh, cube in the next slide. You'll see slide 49. And these are the same values that we yeah. saw in the right-hand column yeah. on the previous yeah, slide. Except that we've, we've, got, we've got two at each point, so we've taken the average mm -hmm. at each corner. And uh, it's making it very clear what those three things are doing. It's saying, first of all, the other factors aren't doing very much. These are the three factors that are, that are important, and this is essentially what they do. And you can you could draw contours in or whatever you want to do, and um, decide where you want to go next and things of that sort. Now, these kinds of uh, experiments are, are really um, very valuable because. Uh, you can screen out, especially at the early stages of investigation, and when you can, can run complex experiments. You can't always run experiments with uh, eight variables uh, because it, it just becomes, uh, if you've got a very complex process, it just becomes too much climbing up and down ladders and so on, trying to adjust these things. But, um, I mean, it depends. I mean, if you're making microchips, it may be a lot easier to do. Uh, it depends, again, on which part of the, the process you're talking about. Um, so, uh, now when we come to teach this stuff, we, um, we like to, uh, we like to uh, teach it with a, uh, with, a, with, uh, with these paper helicopters. And what we do is we, um, we, we have a, uh, we tell the class that we're going to, try and design a paper helicopter which will stay in the air the longest time. 
and we were trying to find out at this stage which are the important variables. And uh, so the kind of variables we will put in there will be variables like um, the, uh, the, the variables like the wing length, wing length, the body length, the body width, the wing width, whether or not you put a fold in the wing, uh, whether or not you put a paper clip on the bottom, and so forth. And you can put, a, very quickly, you can find, come up to eight, with eight factors, which might, well, various people think you have a, you know, you have one of these brainstorming sessions, various people think might, might be important. And, um, and then we, we, so we make up 16 helicopters according to this recipe, and we, we drop our 16 helicopters. And uh, I'm going to show you, uh, well, Jack and I are going to show you a, a little bit of a video which we made some years ago. Um, this video was made by Conrad Fong and uh, Simon Bisgarn and me. And it's about um, running these experiments. And the idea of the video, which actually the video was made by my son, who, who is a, a film Photographer. He's a he's a big shot producer in Hollywood. He's not a big shot producer. He's <laughs> he's try, trying very hard to become a cameraman in Hollywood. Oh. It's not easy. But anyway, he took this movie for us, Harry Box, and um, you'll see, uh, I hope, pretty soon, uh, a clip from that movie, which is showing an experiment where we're running uh, 16 uh, helicopters, and we're dropping 16 helicopters, and we're putting up the results, we plot the results. Uh, well, I'll tell you about what we did afterwards, but here's the way the experiment looks when it was run. Okay, we're gonna bring up the so, video okay. now. Now we're ready to run the experiment. <laughs> That was uh, Soren Bisgard, Conrad Fung, and uh, Paul Newman. I mean, uh, George Box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, well, so actually, what we do after this is is uh, we we plot these points on the uh, on the uh, that uh, uh, normal probability paper, Daniel plot, as I call it, and um, and it, it turns out it turned out in that. Uh, thing and it usually turns out actually uh, for those particular sets of factors that the important thing is the wing length and the body length. You actually need a longer a longer wing and a, a somewhat shorter body. And since then you can we've been making uh, helicopters with a when we introduced this factor which is the thickness of the of the body and that turns out to be important too. Has anyone ever put paper clips at the tips of the uh, rotors? Now that's something we're waiting for you to do because no one's okay. done that. But but uh, there's a chance. There's there's a you know an infinite number of variations can be done on this thing. In mm -hmm. fact, you might even get to run an L36 or something like that on it mm. uh, with um, 37 factors. I mean, or 30 to 35. Mm. Uh, anyway, uh, this is um, the. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, that uh, we like to do with our engineers. Um, you can, you know, get involved in um, a lot of uh, numerical calculations and so forth. You can get involved in a lot of theory and so on, but um, I think that this subject is the one that you can very well present to engineers um, in a way that if they feel very comfortable with and which doesn't get involved in all that stuff. 
Even if they've never had a course in statistics or experimental design it's before? It's better if they haven't had a course in statistics. Oh, really? Well, I found when I go into uh, industry that um, I, send, I meet two kinds of people. One kind of person says to me, oh, yeah, we had a course in statistics and no use to anybody, absolutely valueless. And, and um, so you're starting at sort of minus 10 instead of uh, at uh, zero with those people. Uh, because, uh, you know, they've taught them the wrong things. They get all involved in complicated probability and so forth, and they probably never get out of it. They don't realize that the way you teach anything, in my opinion, is to start off with an example. Mm -hmm. And uh, if possible, a hands-on example. And I think we're moving into an information uh, era in which, uh, you know, the brain is a very poor storage mechanism. I mean. I and the older it gets, the worse it gets. The yeah, worse it gets, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can remember studying chemistry, and, uh, and essentially what happened was the lecturer would, would dictate these things, and we would write the notes down. And what that's saying is information retrieval, the brain's being used for information retrieval and for uh, information retention. And uh, the exams are about that. Well, that's rubbish. I mean, that can't be done anymore, and uh, there's too much information around. And modern computers uh, and information retrieval systems can cope with that very much better. What we should be teaching our students, I think, is the outline of that subject, the broad outlines, teaching them about information retrieval, about um, um, and about problem solving. You know, unstructured problem solving, and uh, in that area, whatever the area may be, and. Uh, I think some people are, uh, are trying to do that, but it's the problem is that it's a lot more effort to do that than it is to teach last year's notes. Amen. And so <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard to get people with, to do this, but it's much more fun with, with uh, students. I, uh, I was teaching a course a couple of months ago in uh, Trondheim uh, in Norway, and uh, I... Uh, I was teaching it with a couple of Norwegian people uh, who'd, who'd been to Madison and uh, spent some time here. And um, we were all happy together. And, uh, and I, one of the things they were going to do was to work, do on the workshops, you know, slide stuff. And I told them I wanted a workshop for a two-cubed experimental design. And they said uh, they, they'd see it. I didn't say what it ought to be or anything. But what they came up with was really ni nice, I thought. It was actually, what they had was two different kinds of beer. Uh, those were the factors, two different kinds of beer. Uh, two different kinds of glass uh, which you poured the beer into. One was a nice smooth glass, and the other was one of these crinkly little glasses, you know. And the third one was um, the angle at which you tilted the glass when you poured the beer in. And the thing they measured was the height of the, the thong on the beer. <laughs> and it, it had a nice, there was a nice main effect, I think it was the angle, but it also there was an interaction, I think an interaction between the, the, um, the angle and, the, um, and whether or not you had crinkly glass. Crinkly glass yeah. actually contributed? Yeah, I think it did, yeah. Amazing. And, but it, it was an interactive effect. So anyway, the, those Norwegians finished up by drinking all that beer, and uh, it was towards the end of the day, of course. So um, uh, in a way, they had a great time, both um, uh, socially and uh, uh, intellectually. Yeah. And I, th I think that design of experiments is great. <laughs> 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 well, um, one of the things I wanted to get in was a, a uh, sometime when we, when we get on, to that last slide, I wanted to say that um, you may, at some point, want further information about us. And uh, I, I would appreciate if you would address each of these uh, items on there, yeah, uh, so that the folks uh, know where they where they can get them and yeah. and what's what's in them. Well, uh, they I've just put a few things up there, and uh, the first one is a book which. Um, uh, people, people who want to know more about the kind of thing I've been talking about, there is a uh, quite a good book which is by me and the two hunters, who, uh, as you, you said, you thought were brothers, but yeah. they're, they're not brothers. They were both at one time students of mine, um, 
Bill Hunter and Stu Hunter, and unfortunately Bill Hunter died some years ago. But um, George, the, excuse me for interrupting. Yeah. I'm, I'm told that we have a uh, phone call oh. with a, a question for you from Polaroid Corporation. Oh yes. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a Mr. or Miss or Ms. Harris. Okay. But uh, caller, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you on my earphone. I don't hear you in the uh, uh, in the studio. So I'll, if you'll go ahead and repeat your question, I'll I'll take it over to George. Okay, I have a two-part question. Okay, this is for Mr. Harris at Polaroid. Yeah. Go ahead, and then I'll take it over to George. Okay. Uh, the question is, if okay. most factors have nonlinear effects, how do we design screening experiments? Since most factors have nonlinear effects, how do we design screening experiments? Yes. I, is, that, is that your question? Yeah, that's the first question. And okay. I have a second question. Okay. Um, well... I, I certainly think that most factors have non-linear non uh, effects, but quite a lot of factors, the principal effect can be a linear effect. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that um, if you're only wanting to run a few experiments, then um, this is not a magic formula which will solve every problem that ever existed. And it's always possible to say, suppose this and suppose that and suppose the other. What does happen is that um, with a, a very small number of experiments, you can very often find factors which are affecting, um, a, um, which are affecting uh, uh, linear, which are affecting things roughly linearly. It don't have to be exactly linear. Uh, the other thing is, uh, by running experiments in the center of the cube, you can do what's called a, a um, uh, well an overall test for nonlinearity which is taking the average of the outer points against the average of the inner points and when you have some suggestion of nonlinear effects you can add points along those main axes to produce what's called a composite design but um, you know the, the, what we're trying to do here is not and we can't do this. We can't cover every conceivable contingency. Um, what we're tr it's like trying to play poker better. Uh, we're playing against nature. Nature can always fool us. But, um, and nobody can produce, uh, nobody can teach someone to play poker so that they, they always win. What they can do is teach them to play poker so they win more often. Mm -hmm. And that's all statistics can do. Uh, it's always possible to have. Uh... The other thing about nonlinear effects is that, um, like everything else, um, very often nonlinear effects arise because you were measuring things in the wrong metric. You should be taking logs or reciprocals or whatever. And um, you'll find quite a bit of discussion of that in not here, obviously, because we can't do it in just an hour or so. But in the book, for example, that I was talking about. And Mr. Harris, I hope that helped. How about your second question? And then we have a call from a, uh, a gentleman at Hewlett Packard. Uh, go, to, go ahead, Mr. Harris. Yes, thank you. The second question is, could you please comment on de-optimal design versus orthogonal, especially if some combinations cannot be performed, in other words, missing points? You're talking about missing data? Uh, uh, the two, those two designs, uh, especially when some combinations cannot be performed. Um, well, um, the the question about that is really concerned with regions, and uh, the um, what is the region of experimentation? And some people think the region of experimentation is the whole region of the experimentation. Well, because it isn't. You're usually interested in some particular place you start up where you know the thing will work, and you're trying to find out what's going on locally. Now, my, I don't like the optimal designs, and I don't like um, A optimal or E optimal or what I call alphabetic optimality at all. The reason I don't is because in order to do that, we've, we're supposed to know everything we don't know at the beginning. If they say, tell us the factors you're interested in, which very often we don't know. Tell us the region that these factors operate over, which very often we don't know. And um, tell us the function involved, and we will design for you a de-optimal design. And if all those assumptions are true, this will be a very good design. Nobody mentions that very much, but it's true. 
Um, the great thing about factorial experiments, maybe if you could put the vertical camera down, I could just show this. Uh, can you, is that on? Can I, can I show you? On on. Vertical camera's on. I don't see it on, but. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Um, the great thing about factorial experiments is this, that they, you know, the thing that the brain does, the thing that the, that the, the, um, the brain uh, is able to do is, um, I, I, you know, a three-year-old, uh, for example, uh, manual uh, for, for kids, I saw in a drugstore the other day, it was sort of called Same or Different, and you had to say, you know, whether these umbrellas were the same or whether they were different and so on. And that, Well, the factorial design is a supreme example of Same or Different, and therefore a supreme example of not knowing in advance what is going on, but trying to figure out what's going on. I can compare that point with that point, understand the conditions of the other variables, this point with this point, this point with this point, this point with this point, same or different, same or different, same or different, same or different, same or different. Same or different. Are the average differences the same or are they different and so on? So I'm not saying with factorial designs that, I mean, we can justify these factorial designs a priori by my orthogonality and all that sort of stuff. But I'm talking about creativity, and for that purpose, I mean, it, it seems to me de optimality assumes what we, what we know, what we are supposed to, what we don't know. And, uh, and for that, unless you know a great deal about the, about the problem, I wouldn't do that. The other thing I don't like about de optimality is that people make a great fuss about de optimality. There's a there's a design, for example, for uh, three levels, and uh, Fedorov makes a great fuss about the fact that the de-optimal design, that is not a de-optimal design for a uh, quadratic surface over that region. And there is a different distribution of points, uh, uh, which gives a de-optimal design. But the interesting thing about it is that if you increase the size of this uh, factorial design, by about half a percentage in each direction. In other words, if this was 20 degrees and this was 40 degrees, you increased it from 20 to 40.5, say, or 40.2. Uh, this design would have the same D value as the other one. So this, this business is tremendously sensitive to region, and uh, D, the D value changes enormously on, on, on region. It changes as a very high power of the, of the size of the design. So I, I think that uh, the application of those things are somewhat limited. I agree that there are occasions when if you render a design like this, you couldn't run that point. That's not necessarily the end of the world. You can still run designs with missing values. Or you can think of the design as being run, um, a design as being run if this is a natural barrier or something like that, in this way. I'm not saying you should never run uh, de optimal designs. They, I've they written, have their place. They have their place. But I am saying that the point that's been missed, and I've heard nobody talk about, is the creative nature of, of factorial designs, which is very, very important. Mr. Harris, does that help a little bit? Apparently, Mr. Harris is gone. I hope, I hope you heard the presentation. <laughs> and, and during the course of your uh, very eloquent. <laughs> I have no idea what that was, no. but it sure it sure wasn't very pleasant. No. Uh, during the course of your very, very eloquent discussion, uh, we lost our uh, our lady from Hewlett Packard. Oh, so let's let's continue on. If she calls back, we'll try and pick her up. Yeah, I was talking about the uh, where we could you could get some further information about some of these things, and uh, I mentioned this book, um, Statistics for Experimenters, and uh, that is written for engineers and other experimenters. And uh, I think you'd find some of the ideas that I've been talking about there were explained uh, in more detail. Daniel, Cuthbert Daniel, uh, wrote a very good book uh, called Applications of Statistics to Industrial Experimentation. That's also published by John Wiley. Where, whereabouts did uh, Dr. Daniel teach? Well, he didn't. I um, mean, he, he was an engineer um, and a private consultant. And uh, but he came up with all kinds of clever ideas 
as is very often the case. I mean, when you ask where the really original ideas in statistics came from, starting with Gauss, for example, who invented least squares because he, I mean, that's just an exaggeration, but he invented least squares mainly because he wanted to, somebody asked him what was the distance between Potsdam and, and, and Berlin, and he got all these uh, measurements, which from this village to this village and this village and so on. And actually, if you read Gauss's original manuscript, he uh, solves that problem and calculates by least squares what the shortest distance, what the <laughs> best distance is. Could uh, you further explain what data? Yeah, well, we, Mr. Harris from uh, Polaroid, yeah. uh, remember he disappeared kind of towards the end yeah, of your discussion? Yeah. Apparently what he was doing was putting together a uh, this fax for us, which just came in from Polaroid in Waltham, Massachusetts. Yeah. And he's asked uh, Dr. Box, could you further explain what data you're plotting in the Daniel or normal plot? Yeah. Well, what what's being done there is we're saying um, each of those factors that we've changed, we have in that column, we have uh, eight runs that have been run at the low level of that factor and eight runs that have been run at the high level of the factor. So if we take the average of these eight runs against the average of those eight runs, we have an average difference. And that is called the effect due to that factor. It's how much, when we change temperature from 120 to 140, from minus to plus, how much does the yield change? 5.6 units, that's called the effect. Mm -hmm. And so we take all those effects and we plot them. And you'll notice that there's actually more effects out there than, uh, than, than eight. And that's because we're also looking at, at groups of interactions in that thing as well to see whether, though we can't look at individual interactions, we can look at groups of interactions and see whether those are. It, it, uh, but there's a very good, um, in both uh, Daniel's book and uh, in our book, you'll see a, a very full explanation of, of those those plots. George, before we lose her again, I too, uh, from Hewlett Packard, yeah. is back on the line. Uh, I believe this is her third time, so we don't want to lose her. Yeah. Uh, are you there? I, I too, can you hear yes. us? Uh, yes, I'm are you, here. Are you located in Santa Clara? Santa Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa, California. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, okay. Welcome to Continuous Improvement. Please ask uh, Dr. Box your question. Yeah. Hi, Professor Box. Remember yeah. me? I'm the Sonoma County statistician here. Oh, yeah. It was great to re <laughs> review the helicopter experiment that 60 engineers and engineering oh, manager run here. I remember that. In yeah. 1989. Yeah. <laughs> and we have 14 engineers here today watching you in this room. Oh, Just that's, want to let you know that's, that. That's really nice. Yeah, I remember that time. We had a great time together. <laughs> <laughs> we got we got fourteen different people here today. Yeah, yeah, good. And I have one clarification question for you on slide forty-three. Slide the break-even plane. Yeah. What was the break-even point? I forgot. I, I didn't catch it. You no. Know, uh, oh, wow. I too. We have we have two different numbering systems. There's the, oh, uh, oh. okay, is the one that's on the screen now? Uh, the one that you want? Is, is that the one? Yes, you, okay, one. good, they've got it. Mm. Yeah, well, the, you, see, you see there, the problem was this, that, that two of these things we could, we could put money on. We could, uh -huh. uh, two of them was the, one of them was the yield, and we could say for every 1% of yield we get, uh, for dog food, for example, I mean, it's easy to calculate, uh, for every 1% of yield, uh, we, we uh, save so much on the uh, on a pound of dog food. We save one cent or something on a pound of dog food. And uh, the other thing was that similarly, uh, it, the the other thing that's been measured that you can actually the response that you can actually put a number on as far as money is concerned is the energy that's being used in that process while they're running. Oh, okay, that so it's the yielding and so, the energy. So so the okay. putting those two things together because one's going one way and one's going the other, you get this plane where you're breaking even on those two things. Now, we don't know how much it costs us to produce a, a less than perfect product as far as the, the, the powder in the dog food's concerned. So what we can do is to say, without running into any more expense, or we could have added more contours and say, or oh, for an extra two cents or an extra less or whatever, uh, we can, um, but, but as far as this is concerned, uh, without running to any extra expense. Yeah, we, that's fine. I just, can, yeah. I just missed that yield yeah. and energy. I and, thought and, I heard and, those. Yeah. I want to make sure. So that you can see you can get about a 30% mm -hmm. reduction or something like that uh, oh. in this case. 
uh, and not really cost you anything more either in terms of energy or in terms of yield. Okay. I Thank you. Does that help some? Yes. And also, when I explain this to our engineers, they really like your example of the rabbit. That's a perfect example to explain what an interaction is. The, the rabbit? <laughs> we, we've, the bunny? We have not benefited from that story. <laughs> About the rabbit? Yeah. Okay, if, if, you're, uh, if you've asked your, your question and it's been satisfactorily answered, I'll ask Dr. Box to uh, tell us the story of the rabbit. Oh, tell us about the rabbit. Are, are we finished, I2? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. thank you very much for yeah. calling. And uh, another engineer, Phil, here wants to ask another question. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the story about the rabbit, if we could we'll just have that, that, uh, that thing on again, uh, the overhead thing was this, that I, I wanted to, uh, sometimes people say, well, engine, uh, the, the interactions, interactions aren't important. And uh, so uh, I wanted to sort of dramatically illustrate that they may be that they are important. And I said, suppose we ran an experiment on bre breeding rabbits. Now, uh, this is whether we have a doe in the hutch or whether we, we don't have a doe in the hutch, whether we do have a doe in the hutch. And this is whether we have a a buck in the hutch or whether we don't have a buck in the hutch. Now you can see if we have no doe and no buck we don't get any rabbits and if we have a buck but we don't have any doe we don't get any rabbits and if we have a uh, doe but we don't have any buck we don't get any rabbits but in this, uh, this thing here we get all these little rabbits you see and this is an interaction and uh, I was just saying well that's not all that strange and in fact um, other interactions of course are whenever Whenever uh, you need two things to come together in order to, to produce an effect, and you know, if, you don't have to go to the atomic bomb or or or, or a Mars lander, uh, you know, or anything <laughs> like that, to see that that's happening all the time, and that those effects are mostly being missed because people run this experiment, they run one factor of time experiment, they run those three, but they never run that one. And then they wonder why they don't get any rabbits. <laughs> no rabbits. <laughs> okay, uh, I do. Let's let's hear that other question. Yes, yeah, so I'm. I'm Phil Fraser, at HP in Santa Rosa, and the question I had was on uh, slide 31, where you talked of the ball bearing experiment. Yeah. Okay. I didn't understand the the uh, meaning of osculation. Yeah, osculation is 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 well, actually it means kissing, uh, and uh, it's as the the um, you can have a, 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 a apparently you can have ball bearings where there's more contact between the balls and the and the run the thing that they run in or less and <coughs> they call that the amount of osculation so they change that and if you change the type of balls as well which is actually achieved by heat treatment uh, then you can get uh, get that big effect. Does uh, Phil, does that help? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. And I believe uh, we're, we're back to just you and I again. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's talk a little bit more about that very last slide uh, and some of the uh, publications uh, and uh, media that are available to our viewers. Well, the Center for Quality and Productivity here in Madison, which is uh, 610 Walnut Street, part of the University of Wisconsin and the department, uh, the, uh, School of Engineering here, uh, we, we have put out about 126 research reports on various kinds of things. And some of these are about management, some of these are about um, experimental design, some are about control problems and so forth. What kind of cost is associated with those, George? Very little. I mean, uh, we're, we're not allowed to make a profit. So if, if, if putting together a technical report costs four bucks, and then that's what we have to charge. So if, if, if our viewers wanted uh, to get to find out what was available, they could either call the number or contact the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the institute, the center, uh, yeah. at the email address that's on their screen yeah. and, uh, and get a, uh, a summary of what was available in the various that's costs. That's right, that's right. And you've got a summary of each one of the reports. Okay. Uh, the helicopter experiment, if anyone's interested in seeing that again, that's on videotape, designing industrial experiments, the video tapes by me and Soren Bisgaard and Conrad Fung, and it's available from Scientific Computing Associates, which you see the address there, Suite 3H, and so on. About how long a video is that in total? It's uh, six uh, tapes, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, so you write right from the very beginning to the end. Of the yeah, yeah. 
And uh, there's uh, that, I think it's tape number three or something like that. But there's six tapes. The starting off, it's all about quality and so on. It starts off with um, some of the basic ideas about, um, you know, the seven tools and things mm -hmm. like that. And uh, ends up with um, with this kind of stuff with experiment design and so okay. on. And uh, also some stuff about a robust design and things like that. Uh, and uh, the and then um, there, there's also uh, some engineers might be interested in our courses that we teach at CQPR. We uh, there's uh, courses taught by the centre for industry, and we get quite a lot of people coming here from all over the country and sometimes from abroad um, at these at these courses. And then we're presently teaching two courses. Designing Industrial Experiment and Engineers Key to Quality. That one comes on about twice a year. And um, recently we've started a new one, which is Designing Experiments for Discovery, Improvement and Robustness. And that's uh, going beyond the basic principles. That's, a, again, a very, uh, not a, it's not a, a lot of, there's no mathematics or anything like that. And it's all done with examples and diagrams and whatnot. Uh, but it's, uh, it's taking the thing rather further. And we're thinking of putting on a third course, which is about uh, about um, control. But taking control, you know, people think of control as, as uh, either SPC uh, or else uh, the engineering automatic control. Mm -hmm. And they have sometimes the trouble in uh, seeing where these things, like everything else, I mean, there's a place for both of these, and they also uh, fit how together. How they fit together. Yeah. And so that course will be about that. We're working on that right now. And I, and I would gather from uh, what I too said that you also take these courses on the road yep. and if an organization desired to have uh, one or more of you uh, come out there and, and present this for their engineers mm -hmm. on site that, that that is not a remote possibility. That can sometimes be done, yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, and I understand We do, we do prefer, it, prefer it if they can come to Madison because it, it's more convenient for us. We, you know, we're, we're sort of... Uh, only a small organization, and it's hard to... But in, in terms of being cost-effective, if they yeah. were going to send 14 or 15 people, yeah. Yeah. It, it might be easier for one yeah. of you to go out there. It, it might, yeah. Okay, well, we're, we're coming to the close of our, our uh, conversation, our dialogue now, and we've only got about a minute or two left, and so I'm going to use this opportunity, George, to, uh, to do a little wrap-up. Uh, this, this will complete our telecast we're here on uh, June 12th, 1995 with George Box uh, talking about uh, using design of experiments for continuous improvement. Uh, it also completes the series for the first half of 1995. Uh, in previous months, as you may recall, we've talked about TRIZ, which is an a, a Russian acronym for the theory of innovative problem solving. Uh, we've talked about uh, using teams, uh, why we work together. We've talked about robust design and the loss function. Uh, We've talked about a whole variety of topics, and we also talked about a group of things uh, during our series last year. Uh, any one or all of these videotapes are available uh, for, uh, for your use at your organization through National Technological University. Uh, I will take this opportunity to say thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure having my guest, George Boxer. George, as always, you were eloquent. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I, I hope our audience appreciated the fact that you've got here uh, a living legend, a, a man who's brought uh, an awful lot to the table. And uh, so I'm going to say uh, thank you very much and uh, look forward to seeing you all again sometime in the near future. Thank you.